Good morning and welcome to the Forum Press Center. We're honored to welcome today um, Assistant Secretary for East Asian Pacific, uh, Daniel Russell. After Assistant Secretary's remarks, we'll have a time for some Q&A. We do request that you state your name and media affiliation, and we'll also be taking uh, questions from Washington, D.C. by a digital, vid digital video conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Hello, everybody. It's great to be back in New York, as always. I'm a New Yorker, and hello to our uh, friends and colleagues in D.C. We've had a, a very busy and I think a very productive week here uh, at the UN uh, with the opening of the General Assembly. There's been a, it's been a productive uh, series of, of days uh, with respect to our diplomacy in the Asia Pacific region. The President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the top State Department uh, officials, uh, myself, have all been working here with our partners in Asia and the Pacific on the issues that are of greatest concern to the American people. And this reflects the continued evolution and vitality of the rebalance. Uh, we're addressing challenges and concerns that matter, frankly, uh, to all of us. Let me give you, if I can, a quick snapshot of some of the work that uh, we've engaged in. In terms of addressing global challenges, the President participated in uh, several important leader summits and multilateral summits uh, on peacekeeping, on countering ISIL and violent extremism. Uh, and these are meetings that included the active participation and the significant contribution of a number of countries from the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, the peacekeeping uh, summit, for example, included uh, quite a few countries from East Asia and the Pacific who I think in aggregate pledged uh, in excess of 10,000 uh, peacekeepers and made very significant financial contributions. In the uh, summit, uh, of the uh, counter ISIL and uh, counter violent extremism uh, members. Countries from the uh, East Asian and Pacific region uh, renewed their commitment to uh, make progress, including and importantly by engaging civil society, engaging uh, religious leaders uh, throughout the, the region and in Undertaking projects, one that's under active consideration is the stationing of a messaging center in Malaysia, for example. And the goal is to try to give voice to those uh, voices of moderation uh, who need to be heard in the face of a, uh, of a flawed and, uh, and dangerous ideology. On the regional front, uh, the Secretary had a very productive meeting with the 10 foreign ministers from the ASEAN countries. Uh, this is a, a regular feature of what the Secretary of State does uh, during UNGA, and it's valuable in a number of respects. The Secretary and the foreign ministers were able to dig down on important issues like uh, maritime security, particularly the situation in the South China Sea. They were able to uh, discuss in, in some depth uh, issues regarding the oceans and the challenges uh, that will be taken up uh, next week in Santiago at the Oceans Conference, things like illegal and unreported, unregulated fishing. Things like, uh, of course, the big project that we're all engaged in in the run-up to the Paris Climate Conference in addressing global warming. Uh, and they also were able to consult on the recurring problem of irregular migration, the, the problem of uh, migrants uh, from Bangladesh and from, uh, from Myanmar, from Burma. 
uh, which the region dealt with uh, earlier in the year, in May, and which unfortunately uh, it appears we may have to deal with yet again when the rainy season ends. Uh, we also held a meeting uh, that I attended uh, with Todd Stern, our Special Envoy on Climate, and uh, Ambassador Samantha Power, our UN Perm Rep, with the foreign ministers and representatives of the Pacific Island states. These are nations uh, with whom the United States has very close partnerships, but nations also that are most directly and grievously affected by the consequences of uh, global warming. They're also important to uh, global efforts to preserve our oceans and to, uh, and to deal with problems really regarding, that I've mentioned regarding uh, illegal and unregulated fishing. There were a, a large number of trilateral meetings uh, this year, and I think that reflects uh, America's support for a kind of flexible geometry uh, of uh, collaboration among countries that share important goals and uh, common values. Uh, first and foremost is uh, another session of the uh, trilateral that the Secretary shared with the Japanese and the Korean foreign ministers. Uh, this is one of the regular uh, trilaterals. It's also one of the most important and one of the most productive. It allows for very close coordination among uh, our closest allies in uh, Northeast Asia. And it enabled the three ministers to uh, compare notes and to consult closely on the issues regarding North Korea, uh, particularly North Korea's uh, continued violation of the UN Security Council resolutions. It's ongoing uh, efforts to uh, develop nuclear and missile capabilities in defiance of those uh, regulations, uh, and also the uh, problematic human rights situation in New York, in uh, North Korea as well. Uh, there were other regional and global uh, issues that the three ministers were able to touch upon. They're in regular uh, touch, and I know that uh, the two foreign ministers from Japan and Korea followed up the, f the next day uh, with their own bilateral meeting. For the very first time, uh, Secretary Kerry participated in a trilateral with uh, both the Japanese and the Indian foreign minister. That uh, focused, among other things, on the uh, convergence among uh, three of the world's largest democracies particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, the vehicle for our close uh, political and security coordination on matters pertaining to East Asia is, of course, the East Asia Summit. And they were able to exchange views both uh, about what the professionals call architecture, the structure of interaction with ASEAN at the center, uh, but also some of the issues uh, that are high on the agenda of the East Asia Summit. Uh, at a slightly less exalted level, we held the trilateral meeting uh, among Australia, Japan, and the United States, what we call the Trilateral Security Dialogue, or TSD, which sometimes meets at the secretarial level, sometimes meets at my level, um, and on occasion meets at leaders' level as well. Um, this meeting included the participation of uh, Ambassador Tom Shannon, the counselor of the State Department who President Obama has nominated uh, to succeed Wendy Sherman as our new Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. So uh, in this meeting and elsewhere, uh, Tom, who's uh, not only a dear friend of mine, but one of America's most distinguished diplomats, was able to uh, participate, and that's something that we value a great deal. Um, I uh, co-chaired a meeting with my uh, Japanese counterpart and with the foreign minister of Mongolia 
uh, U.S.-Japan-Mongolia uh, trilateral. Here again, three important uh, democracies and what I'd call uh, Mongolia's two best uh, second neighbors, or third neighbors, I guess I should say. Um, we were able to uh, have a very, very fruitful and productive exchange on a range of issues there. And then lastly, on the bilateral front, uh, I joined Vice President Biden uh, and others, including our trade representative, Mike Froman, earlier in the week for a very valuable consultation with uh, the Japanese Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, that allowed for uh, a full discussion across a range of political and trade issues. Uh, and I joined, of course, uh, Secretary Kerry's meetings. Uh, he had bilateral meetings with the NI, on a PP uh, partner, uh, a member of ASEAN, of course, uh, and a good friend of the United States. Uh, he met bilaterally uh, this morning with uh, the foreign minister of, of Myanmar, Moi Mong Lin, and was able to uh, get an update on preparations for the for the Burmese elections, as well as uh, consult on important issues like the irregular migration problem and human rights. Uh, other uh, other U.S. officials, uh, Deputy Secretary Tony Blinken, uh, and a variety of others, including myself, uh, separately had bilateral meetings uh, with the foreign ministers or the vice foreign ministers, or in some cases the presidents of a number of countries in the region, Vietnam, Thailand, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, Australia, Laos, Malaysia, Palau, Republic of Marshall Islands. And in addition, uh, I certainly had opportunities for contact, as I know did uh, the Secretary and uh, for that matter, President Obama, with a number of other uh, representatives from, from Asia. Now, there's a lot going on. Uh, we had a very productive week, as I said. This week comes uh, directly on the heels of the uh, important in-depth conversations that President Obama and other top officials had with the Chinese President, Xi Jinping, in Washington late last week. And we're not slowing down. Uh, our Deputy Secretary, Tony Blinken, is leaving this weekend for consultations in Northeast Asia, first in Tokyo, then in Seoul, then in Beijing. Uh, I will be leaving myself next week to go out to Malaysia uh, for the senior officials meeting uh, organized by ASEAN, in which I'll have a chance to meet not only with my counterparts from the 10 Southeast Asian nations, but also uh, counterparts from China, from Japan, from India, from Australia, New Zealand, the ROK, the countries that are represented in the East Asia Summit. And one of the important things we'll be doing is preparing for November when our leaders, after having attended APEC in Manila, go to Kuala Lumpur for uh, the EAS. Uh, we, in October, are also uh, preparing in Washington for and, and elsewhere for visits, um, the visit of the Korean president, the visit of the Indonesian president. Uh, we're expecting uh, consultations with our Australian uh, counterparts at the secretary's level. Uh, there's a lot on the agenda as pertains to uh, Asia, and with that, let me uh, open the floor for questions. Um, thank you for a briefing. Um, I, ha I, I am Moeko from Tokyo Broadcasting System. I have a question on the uh, tri trilateral meeting with Japan and Mongolia. Um, was there um, DPRK on the table to be discussed? And if so, could you give us a little bit more detail on what has been talked? Uh, let me dip down into my memory bank. 
because we had quite a few um, we had quite a few meetings. Um, I was recently in Mongolia, and uh, I had bilateral consultations there, and was able to discuss with Foreign Minister Purusura and other senior officials uh, a number of uh, regional issues, including uh, the challenge that uh, is presented by North Korea. Um, if my memory serves me right, uh, we may have touched on uh, North Korea as a regional matter, um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't describe it as uh, as the focus. Uh, we talked about the challenges that are that Mongolia faces both strategically and economically. We had an extensive discussion about how, uh, as major investors and economies, the United States and Japan can support uh, reforms, can support the uh, improved investment climate in Mongolia. Uh, we commended uh, Mongolia's um, just unremitting uh, fidelity to democracy and discussed uh, what the Mongolians uh, do and how valuable we see it in democracy promotion around the world. Uh, now, it'll be a long time before we see democracy promotion in North Korea, but unfortunately. But uh, we are seeing an important contribution made by uh, the Mongolians who stand as a, a great model uh, of political reform uh, with countries like Myanmar who are approaching their own elections and I have a lot to learn from the Mongolians. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, reportedly, uh, United States and Japan, they're seeking um, Mongolia to be kind of mitigator um, in the North Korean issues. Is that true? No. The United States uh, and Japan each have our own respective channels for uh, communicating with the DPRK. The problem isn't that we lack a vehicle for uh, communicating with the North Koreans. The problem is that the North Koreans refuse uh, either to negotiate on the nuclear issue or to honor the commitments that they have already made in previous rounds of negotiations. Now, that's not to say that uh, there isn't a constructive role for uh, Mongolia as a uh, democracy, as a neighbor, uh, and as hopefully a role model for the DPRK. Um, but it's not as uh, it's not as a mediator. Now I know that uh, President Elbigdorj visited uh, North Korea some time ago, and I think there's great value in the uh, direct, if not blunt, message that. He conveyed, uh, speaking as someone who knows after uh, an extended period of uh, communist dictatorship, that uh, reform, both political and economic reform, uh, brings immense benefits and brings greater security. I hope the North Koreans were listening. Hi. Yes, hi. hi. Thank you. Thanks for coming to uh, New York. Jane with China. Um, first of all, yesterday, Jane has tried to clear all the error from the U.S. on the accusation um, of the airstrike. How do you answer the, that people are saying that um, Putin's military action is a diversionary strategy to take attention away from Ukraine? And uh, could it expect any sort of cooperation between U.S. and uh, Russian soon in Syria. And I have to ask about President Xi's visit. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese ambassador noticed that each stop will have some surprises. Did you see the surprises from his visit? <laughs> and um, Or it's all go under your pre predicted. Thank you. Well, on the first question, I will um, respectfully defer to my esteemed colleague, uh, Admiral John Kirby, the spokesman of the State Department. I'm not the official responsible for either Russia or Syria, so I don't have any light to shed on that. 
Um, I'll also ask Ambassador Tsui Ting Kai to speak for himself as to what he had in mind in terms of uh, surprises uh, at each juncture. As someone who was actively involved in the preparations for the visit by President Xi, I can attest to the fact that we worked very hard to avoid surprises. <laughs> and for that purpose, uh, as did other officials, I traveled to China uh, at the very beginning of this month, and I spent a considerable time in Beijing meeting with the foreign ministry officials, various counterparts, talking through the agenda and working on the substance of what it is that we thought that the two leaders should be discussing, in which meeting, what sorts of messages we thought it would be desirable for President Xi to articulate in his various public engagements, and the uh, outcomes and deliverables, the, the results, the, the accomplishments that the, our respective um, agencies and bureaucracies had been working on that could be brought to conclusion and ratified by our two presidents. We got a lot done. In my view, the most effective presentations that our leaders held in Washington last Thursday and Friday was the opportunity for the two presidents to speak directly, candidly, constructively on the problem areas. The two sides worked hard on our differences because we are not reconciled with simply agreeing to disagree. There are significant friction points in the interaction between China and the United States, whether they are bilateral issues or whether they are global issues, those friction points need to be addressed forthrightly by both sides. On the issue of cyber, as you saw, the Chinese leader made very important commitments. And we have now an expanded mechanism whereby we can uh, pursue those issues and help to ensure by working together that those commitments are fulfilled. Uh, the Chinese president took home, I know, a new and clearer awareness of the deep concerns on the part of not only the U.S. government, but also of the U.S. business community and the NGO, think tank, journalistic, and academic community about the possible impact that some draft legislation like the NGO management law or other draft laws and policies would have on uh, our citizens, on our organizations, on our companies, and frankly, on the U.S.-China relationship. And as a result, it is certainly my hope that uh, we will see our concerns taken into account in the way that uh, the Chinese authorities treat uh, U.S. companies and their uh, proprietary information and technology and the way that uh, journalists and academics and others are treated inside China. A third really important area of difference uh, and concern has been the behavior of China in the South China Sea. And while we have uh, made very clear consistently that the U.S. takes no position on the underlying sovereignty claims, in other words, we don't say that land feature X belongs to China or belongs to Vietnam or Philippines uh, because we don't make judgments about the uh, the, the merits of a country's claim. That mustn't be confused with not having any position on the behavior of the countries in a, a sensitive region like the South China Sea. We have very strong views. That shouldn't be confused with not having a position on 
international law and universal rights such as freedom of navigation and overflight uh, that is a right that's inherent to every state not a right that is granted and certainly not something that should be denied by any one country uh, similarly the right of unimpeded lawful commerce it also shouldn't be confused with the fact that we do take a position that all claims by all claimants should be made in ways that are fully consistent with international law, including and particularly uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, President Xi Jinping made what I consider to be important statements in his uh, press availability with President Obama on Friday in the Rose Garden. Uh, he affirmed China's uh, commitment to peaceful and diplomatic uh, resolution of problems. That's an important uh, commitment. Uh, the uh, issue of the nine dash line, for example, is a matter of consideration by the tribunal under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And uh, there will be a decision forthcoming on uh, jurisdiction. Should that uh, decision affirm that the tribunal has jurisdiction over the case brought by the Philippines, then the parties will be heading towards an arbitral decision. That decision under the treaty is equally binding on China and on the Philippines. And as a matter of international law, the United States and the international community expects both countries to honor their uh, treaty obligations. The last point I would make is that we, of course, heard an important statement by President Xi Jinping when he said that China has no intention of militarizing islands or outposts in the South China Sea, in the Spratlys. That I believe uh, offered reassurance and encouragement to China's neighbors, none of whom want to see a, cont a continuation of uh, Chinese large-scale construction on these outposts, let alone uh, the deployment of military assets. If, in fact, as President Xi has said, China is committed to a peaceful resolution of any dispute and has no intention of militarizing its outposts, I believe that the room for uh, a settlement and for the conclusion of agreements, whether they're bilateral agreements or whether they're the code of conduct, uh, will rapidly expand. And naturally, we will, as others will, uh, be discussing in detail with the Chinese uh, the steps that they are taking and will take to ensure that they are in no way militarizing uh, the land features that uh, they are uh, that they have uh, built by dredging sand uh, from the South China Sea. Let's take a question from Washington. Go ahead, Washington. Hi, thank you very much for having this briefing. Uh, my name is Alicia Rose with NHK. Um, the U.S. and China, as you mentioned, recently came to an agreement that not, neither government will conduct cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property. Uh, my question is on what led to this agreement. Uh, in particular, there have been reports that Ambassador Rice met with Chinese counterparts in Beijing where she warned that approximately 25 Chinese state-owned enterprises were under threat of U.S. sanctions for conducting cyber theft against U.S. companies. Is that correct? Well, I'm not the right person to uh, brief on the confidential uh, discussions that uh, our national security advisor had uh, in Beijing. But I myself have uh, discussed the problem of state-sponsored cyber-enabled theft by China of proprietary corporate information um, from U.S. companies 
that is then transferred and, in some cases, marketized. Uh, that is a problem that the President and the Secretary of State and other senior officials have been very direct in uh, flagging for the Chinese as unacceptable behavior. In response to the strong concerns uh, that we have conveyed consistently about that uh, behavior, and in advance of the visit to Washington by President Xi, uh, the Chinese government proposed to send to Washington a very senior official, uh, their uh, secretary uh, the, the, who oversees their law enforcement and intelligence activities, Meng Jinju, and uh, the U.S. side agreed. Um, Secretary Meng led a high-level delegation with a broad spectrum of senior representatives from relevant agencies to Washington, and over the course of two-plus days had in-depth conversations with uh, a U.S. team led by the Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, but uh, that in uh, meetings that also included uh, conversations with Secretary Kerry and with uh, Susan Rice. I think you can see from the agreements that were announced uh, during President Xi's visit that the Chinese side took American concerns seriously. They had heard in Seattle as well from uh, high-tech business leaders, from industry representatives, and from uh, the Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, uh, more uh, concerns about the negative impact that uh, cyber intrusions and particularly um, cyber-enabled economic threat uh, theft was having on our bilateral relationship. I can't top what President Obama himself said on this uh, issue, uh, so I won't try. Um, but I you know, flag for you uh, the fact that he stated very clearly to President Xi as they stood together at the podium that the United States is watching closely uh, to see that, in fact, uh, China is honoring the obligations that they have undertaken in this new agreement. Thank you. My name is Manik Mehta. I'm syndicated in Asia, also in Malaysia, India, etc. You are headed for Malaysia mm -hmm. next week. Could you uh, give some details of what you intend doing there mm -hmm. and whom are you meeting? Mm -hmm. Also, could you clarify what this messaging center is about mm -hmm. in Kuala Lumpur? Mm -hmm. uh, if yes. I may also add another question. This is in regard to the trilateral meeting between U.S., Japan, and India. Is this a precursor to the formation of an alliance in the future? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I am going to Kuala Lumpur to attend the ASEAN and East Asia Summit senior officials' meetings. This is part of the regular preparatory process that we're engaged in uh, year on and year out in uh, preparing for the annual leader summit. So in the multilateral meetings, we will discuss the agenda for the U.S. ASEAN Leaders meeting, we'll discuss the agenda for the uh, East Asia Summit meeting, and we'll also talk uh, more about the substance and how, uh, for example, on the issue of the South China Sea, how uh, the member states of the EAS, which of course importantly include all of the claimants, in this, uh, particularly uh, China, uh, but also include uh, important security partners, such as the United States, um, how collectively uh, we can help to ensure that the, uh, the uh, 
tensions are resolved uh, expeditiously and that the disputes also are managed in a way that's uh, fully compliant with international law uh, and with good diplomatic and good neighborly principles. I will also have the opportunity to hold bilateral meetings with uh, many of the uh, partner uh, and ASEAN countries. The, uh, I was able to meet with a number of the vice foreign ministers or senior official counterparts in New York, but I'll pick up on meetings with the others. Now, when I'm in Malaysia, uh, ordinarily I will meet with a range of uh, senior government officials uh, as well as uh, representatives of civil society, consult with our outstanding embassy in KL, uh, and uh, meet with political uh, leaders from the opposition and try to get a, uh, in contact with a broad section of Malaysian society. Now, as it happens, um, I've had an, the opportunity to um, be in meetings and to speak at considerable length in Washington and now in New York with uh, Foreign Minister Anifa and with uh, Prime Minister Najib as well. And so I, I don't think I necessarily need uh, to repeat those meetings, but I will certainly meet with civil society and with, uh, uh, with representative uh, members of the political uh, spectrum in Malaysia. Um, there is no decision, uh, no final decision on a messaging center, uh, but Malaysia is a leading candidate uh, to serve as the host. There already is a messaging center in the UAE, and what it I think is a hub uh, for the regions in which like-minded uh, countries and particularly civil society leaders and religious leaders uh, can ensure that via traditional and social media means a moderate and an, um, a more uh, credible set of messages is delivered to the broad uh, public that counter the distorted um, messaging uh, being broadcast by ISIL. On your last question, uh, the United States and Japan already have an alliance, and the consultation uh, among these three great countries and three great democracies, India, Japan, and the United States, uh, do include discussions of some security issues, but those issues are uh, those that are fully appropriate for uh, countries that have common interests as we do in addressing disaster relief, humanitarian assistance, uh, and uh, otherwise enhancing our ability to respond to uh, disasters. That's one of the reasons that uh, although the U.S. and India don't have a, a military alliance, we do have an important annual exercise, the Malabar exercise. Hence, we invited Japan to participate in that. But this represents only one fraction of the breadth and the depth of our collective interests, and the discussions uh, touched on a wide range of issues pertaining to good governance, uh, promotion of uh, universal rights and law, um, the uh, broader trends in the uh, Indo-Asia Pacific uh, region, uh, the economy, uh, regional connectivity, and multiple ways in which we can uh, support uh, Prime Minister Modi's Act East policies and work uh, to the common interest. Thank you. Okay, I think this will have to be our last question. Um, do you want to give it to Ron? 
Ron Xu from Voice of America. We don't see a joint statement uh, issued after uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit after the uh, the summit with the with the President Obama. I uh, only see a uh, achievement list. Is that uh, uh, because the lack of uh, positive result or cannot solve uh, the difference uh, difference between the two countries? Uh, no, to the contrary. Uh the United States issued a fact sheet. Uh, the Chinese, via uh, their official press, gave a full readout. We issued a joint statement on uh, climate. Uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding on uh, coordinating humanitarian assistance. Uh, no, there was without a doubt a very rich uh, menu of accomplishments on uh, the issues that I've just mentioned, as well as on the economic front, where again there was a, a, a yet another statement uh, on our military to military uh, relations, which included uh, out of this visit a uh, further step forward in the form of an annex uh, covering air to air encounters to the MOU that was previously signed. Uh, we announced significant progress in our people-to-people -people, uh, relationship, both in terms of tourism promotion and in terms of language uh, training. So no, without a doubt, this was a, a very rich and fruitful uh, set of meetings. If, if there's a non-China question, I think we could take one last one. Do we have any non-China questions? Washington, nope. China related? No. Nope. All right. In that case, let's declare victory. All right. Thank you for attending. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Glad you could come. <laughs>